Chapter Eleven of the Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbit. Chapter Eleven. Before Pharaoh. It was the day after the adventure of Julius Caesar and the little black girl that Cyril, bursting into the bathroom to wash his hands for dinner, you have no idea how dirty they were for he had been playing shipwrecked mariners all the morning on the leads at the back of the house where the water cistern is found anthea leaning her elbows on the edge of the bath and crying steadily into it hello he said with brotherly concern what's up now dinner'll be cold before you've got enough salt water for a bath go away said anthea fiercely i hate you i hate everybody there was a stricken pause i didn't know said cyril tamely nobody ever does know anything sobbed anthea i didn't know you were waxy i thought you'd just hurt your fingers with the tap again like you did last week cyril carefully explained oh fingers sneered anthea through her sniffs here drop it panther he said uncomfortably. You haven't been having a row or anything. No, she said. Wash your horrid hands, for goodness sake, if that's what you came for, or go. Anthea was so seldom cross that when she was cross, the others were always more surprised than angry. Cyril edged along the side of the bath and stood beside her. He put his hand on her arm. Dry up. Do, he said, rather tenderly for him and finding that though she did not at once take his advice she did not seem to resent it he put his arm awkwardly across her shoulders and rubbed his head against her ear there he said in the tone of one administering a priceless cure for all possible sorrows now what's up promise you won't laugh i don't feel laughish myself said cyril dismally well then said anthea leaning her ear against his head. It's mother. What's the matter with mother? asked Cyril, with apparent want of sympathy. She was all right in her letter this morning. Yes, but I want her so. You're not the only one, said Cyril briefly, and the brevity of his tone admitted a good deal. Oh, yes, said Anthea. I know, we all want her all the time. But I want her now most dreadfully, awfully much. I never wanted anything so much. That Imogen child, the way the ancient British Queen cuddled her up. And Imogen wasn't me, and the Queen was mother. And then her letter this morning about the lamb liking the salt bathing. And she bathed him in this very bath the night before she went away. Oh, oh, oh. Cyril thumped her on the back. Cheer up, he said. You know my inside thinking that I was doing? Well, that was partly about mother. We'll soon get her back. If you'll chuck it like a sensible kid and wash your face, I'll tell you about it. That's right. You let me get to the tap. Can't you stop crying? Shall I put the door key down your back? That's for noses said Anthea. And I'm not a kid any more than you are. But she laughed a little, and her mouth began to get back into its proper shape. You know what an odd shape your mouth gets into when you cry in earnest. Look here, said Cyril, working the soap round and round between his hands in a thick slime of grey soap suds. I've been thinking. We've only just played with the amulet so far. We've got to work it now work it for all it's worth and it isn't only mother either there's father out there all among the fighting i don't howl about it but i think oh bother the soap the gray lined soap had squirted out under the pressure of his fingers and had hit anthea's chin with as much force as though it had been shot from a catapult there now she said regretfully now i shall have to wash my face You'd have had to do that anyway, said Cyril with conviction. Now, my idea's this. 
You know missionaries? Yes, said Anthea, who did not know a single one. Well, they always take the savages' beads and brandy and stays and hats and braces and really useful things, things the savages haven't got and never heard about. And the savages love them for their kind generousness and give them pearls and shells and ivory and cassowaries. And that's the way. Wait a sec, said Anthea, splashing. I can't hear what you're saying. Shells and... Shells and things like that. The great thing is to get people to love you by being generous. And that's what we've got to do. Next time we go into the past, we'll regularly fit out the expedition. You remember how the Babylonian queen froze onto that pocketbook? Well, we'll take things like that and offer them in exchange for a sight of the amulet. A sight of it's not much good. No, silly. But don't you see? When we've seen it, we shall know where it is, and we can go and take it in the night when everybody is asleep. It wouldn't be stealing, would it? Said Anthea thoughtfully. Because it will be such an awfully long time ago when we do it. Oh, there's that bell again. As soon as dinner was eaten, it was tinned salmon and lettuce, and a jam tart, and the cloth cleared away. The idea was explained to the others, and the Samiad was aroused from sand, and asked what it thought would be good merchandise with which to buy the affection of, say, the ancient Egyptians, and whether it thought the amulet was likely to be found in the court of Pharaoh. But it shook its head, and shot out its snail's eyes hopelessly. "'I'm not allowed to play in this game,' it said. "'Of course.' I could find out in a minute where the thing was, only I mayn't. But I may go so far as to own that your idea of taking things with you isn't a bad one, and I shouldn't show them all at once. Take small things and conceal them craftily about your persons. This advice seemed good. Soon the table was littered over with things which the children thought likely to interest the ancient Egyptians. Anthea brought dolls, puzzle blocks, a wooden tea service, a green leather case with Nécessaire written on it in gold letters. Aunt Emma had once given it to Anthea, and it had then contained scissors, penknife, bodkin, stiletto, thimble, corkscrew, and glove buttoner. The scissors, knife, and thimble, and penknife were, of course, lost, but the other things were there, and as good as new. Cyril contributed lead soldiers, a cannon, a catapult, a tin opener, a tie clip, and a tennis ball, and a padlock. No key. Robert collected a candle. I don't suppose they ever saw a self-fitting paraffin one, he said. A penny Japanese pin tray, a rubber stamp with his father's name and address on it, and a piece of putty. Jane added a key ring the brass handle of a poker, a pot that had held cold cream, a smoked pearl button off her winter coat, and a key. No lock. We can't take all this rubbish, said Robert, with some scorn. We must just each choose one thing. The afternoon passed very agreeably in the attempt to choose from the table the four most suitable objects. But the four children could not agree what was suitable and at last cyril said look here let's each be blindfolded and reach out and the first thing you touch you stick to this was done cyril touched the padlock anthea got the necessaire robert clutched the candle jane picked up the tie clip it's not much she said i don't believe ancient egyptians wore ties never mind said anthea I believe it's luckier not to really choose. In the stories, it's always the thing the woodcutter's son picks up in the forest and almost throws away because he thinks it's no good that turns out to be the magic thing in the end, or else someone's lost it, and he's rewarded with the hand of the king's daughter in marriage. I don't want any hands in marriage, thank you, said Cyril firmly. Nor yet me, said Robert. It's always the end of the adventures when it comes to the marriage hands. Are we ready? said Anthea. It is Egypt we're going to, isn't it? Nice Egypt, said Jane. I won't go anywhere I don't know about, like that dreadful big wavy burning mountain city, she insisted. 
then the samiad was coaxed into its bag i say said cyril suddenly i'm rather sick of kings and people notice you so in palaces besides the amulet's sure to be in the temple let's just go among the common people and try to work ourselves up by degrees we might get taken on as temple assistants like beetles said anthea or vergers they must have splendid chances of stealing the temple treasures right -o. was the general rejoinder the charm was held up it grew big once again and once again the warm golden eastern light glowed softly beyond it as the children stepped through it loud and furious voices rang in their ears they went suddenly from the quiet of fitzroy street dining room into a very angry eastern crowd a crowd much too angry to notice them they edged through it to the wall of a house and stood there the crowd was of men women and children they were of all sorts of complexions and pictures of them might have been coloured by any child with a shilling paint box the colours that child would have used for complexions would have been yellow ochre red ochre light red sepia and indian ink but their faces were painted already black eyebrows and lashes and some red lips the women wore a sort of pinafore with shoulder straps and loose things wound round their heads and shoulders the men wore very little clothing for they were the working people and the egyptian boys and girls wore nothing at all unless you count the little ornaments hung on chains round their necks and waists the children saw all this before they could hear anything distinctly everyone was shouting so but a voice sounded above the other voices and presently it was speaking in a silence comrades and fellow workers it said and it was the voice of a tall coppery-coloured man who had climbed into a chariot that had been stopped by the crowd its owner had bolted muttering something about calling the guards and now the man spoke from it comrades and fellow workers how long are we to endure the tyranny of our masters who live in idleness and luxury on the fruit of our toil they only give us a bare subsistence wage and they live on the fat of the land we labour all our lives to keep them in wanton luxury let us make an end of it a roar of applause answered him how are you going to do it cried a voice you look out cried another or you'll get yourself into trouble i've heard almost every single word of that whispered robert in hyde park last sunday let us strike for more bread and onions and beer and a longer midday rest the speaker went on you are tired you are hungry you are thirsty you are poor your wives and children are pining for food the barns of the rich are full to bursting with the corn we want the corn our labour is growing to the granaries to, to the, the granaries! granaries cried half the crowd but another voice shouted clear above the tumult to pharaoh to the king let's present a petition to the king he will listen to the voice of the oppressed for a moment the crowd swayed one way and another first towards the granaries and then towards the palace then with a rush like that of an imprisoned torrent suddenly set free it surged along the street towards the palace and the children were carried with it anthea found it difficult to keep the samiad from being squeezed very uncomfortably the crowd swept through the streets of dull-looking houses with few windows very high up across the market where people were not buying but exchanging goods in a momentary pause robert saw a basket of onions exchanged for a hair comb and five fish for a string of beads the people in the market seemed better off than those in the crowd they had finer clothes and more of them they were the kind of people who nowadays would have lived at brixton or brockley what's the trouble now a languid large-eyed lady in a crimped half-transparent linen dress with her black hair very much braided and puffed out 
asked of a date seller ah the working men discontented as usual the man answered listen to em anyone would think it mattered whether they had a little more or less to eat dregs of society said the date seller scum said the lady and i've heard that before too said robert at that moment the voice of the crowd changed from anger to doubt from doubt to fear there were other voices shouting they shouted defiance and menace and they came nearer very quickly there was the rattle of wheels and the pounding of hoofs a voice shouted guards the guards the guards shouted another voice and the crowd of workmen took up the cry the guards Pharaoh's guards and swaying a little once more the crowd hung for a moment as it were balanced then as the trampling hoofs came nearer the workmen fled dispersed up alleys and into the courts of houses and the guards in their embossed leather chariots swept down the street at the gallop their wheels clattering over the stones and their dark-coloured blue tunics blown open and back with the wind of their going so that riot's over said the crimped linen-dressed lady that's a blessing and did you notice the captain of the guard what a very handsome man he was to be sure the four children had taken advantage of the moment's pause before the crowd turned to fly to edge themselves and drag each other into an arched doorway now they each drew a long breath and looked at the others we're well out of that said cyril yes said anthea but i do wish the poor men hadn't been driven back before they could get to the king he might have done something for them not if he was the one in the bible he wouldn't said jane he had a hard heart oh, that was the moses one and here explained the joseph one was quite different i should like to see pharaoh's house i wonder whether it's like the egyptian court in the crystal palace i thought we decided to try to get taken on in a temple said cyril in injured tones yes but we've got to know someone first couldn't we make friends with a temple doorkeeper? We might give him the padlock or something. I wonder which are temples and which are palaces. Robert added, glancing across the marketplace to where an enormous gateway with huge side buildings towered towards the sky. To right and left of it were other buildings, only a little less magnificent. Did you wish to seek out the temple of Amun Ra? asked a soft voice behind them or the temple of moot or the temple of Honsu. they turned to find beside them a young man he was shaved clean from head to foot and on his feet were light papyrus sandals he was clothed in a linen tunic of white embroidered heavily in colours he was gay with anklets bracelets and armlets of gold richly inlaid he wore a ring on his finger and he had a short jacket of gold embroidery something like the zouave soldiers wear and on his neck was a gold collar with many amulets hanging from it but among the amulets the children could see none like theirs it doesn't matter which temple said cyril frankly tell me your mission said the young man i am a divine father of the temple of amun ra and perhaps i can help you well said cyril we've come from the great empire on which the sun never sets i thought somehow that you'd come from some odd out of the way spot said the priest with courtesy and we've seen a good many palaces we thought we should like to see a temple for a change said robert the Samiad stirred uneasily in its embroidered bag. "'Have you brought gifts to the temple?' asked the priest cautiously. "'We have got some gifts,' said Cyril, with equal caution. "'You see, there's magic mixed up in it, so we can't tell you everything, but we don't want to give our gifts for nothing.' "'Beware how you insult the god.' said the priest sternly i also can do magic i can make a waxen image of you and i can say words which 
as the wax image melts before the fire will make you dwindle away and at last perish miserably who said cyril stoutly that's nothing i can make fire itself i should jolly well like to see you do it said the priest unbelievingly well you shall said cyril nothing easier just stand close round me do you need no preparation no fasting no incantations the priest's tone was incredulous the incantation's quite short said cyril taking the hint and as for fasting it's not needed in my sort of magic union jack printing press gunpowder rule britannia come fire at the end of this little stick he had pulled a match from his pocket and as he ended the incantation which contained no words that it seemed likely the egyptian had ever heard he stooped in the little crowd of his relations and the priest and struck the match on his boot he stood up shielding the flame with one hand see he said with modest pride here take it into your hand no thank you said the priest swiftly backing can you do that again yes then come with me to the great double house of pharaoh he loves good magic and he will raise you to honour and glory there's no need of secrets between initiates he went on confidentially the fact is i am out of favour at present owing to a little matter of failure of prophecy i told him a beautiful princess would be sent to him from syria and lo a woman of thirty years old arrived but she was a beautiful woman not so long ago time is only a mode of thought you know the children thrilled to the familiar words so you know that too do you said cyril it is part of the mystery of all magic is it not said the priest now if i bring you to pharaoh the little unpleasantness i spoke of will be forgotten and i will ask pharaoh the great house son of the sun and lord of the south and north to decree that you shall lodge in the temple then you can have a good look round and teach me your magic and i will teach you mine this idea seemed good at least it was better than any other which at that moment occurred to anybody so they followed the priest through the city the streets were very narrow and dirty the best houses the priest explained were built within walls twenty to twenty-five feet high and such windows as showed in the walls were very high up the tops of palm trees showed above the walls the poor people's houses were little square huts with a door and two windows and smoke coming out of a hole in the back the poor egyptians haven't improved so very much in their building since the first time we came to egypt whispered cyril to anthea the huts were roofed with palm branches and everywhere there were chickens and goats and little naked children kicking about in the yellow dust on one roof was a goat who had climbed up and was eating the dry palm leaves with snorts and head tossings of delight over every house door was some sort of figure or shape amulets the priest explained to keep off the evil eye i don't think much of your nice egypt robert whispered to jane it's simply not a patch on babylon ah you wait till you see the palace jane whispered back the palace was indeed much more magnificent than anything they had yet seen that day though it would have made but a poor show beside that of the babylonian king 
they came to it through a great square pillared doorway of sandstone that stood in a high brick wall the shut doors were of massive cedar with bronze hinges and were studded with bronze nails at the side was a little door and a wicket gate and through this the priest led the children he seemed to know a word that made the sentries make way for him inside was a garden planted with hundreds of different kinds of trees and flowering shrubs a lake full of fish with blue lotus flowers at the margin and ducks swimming about cheerfully and looking as jane said quite modern the guard chamber the storehouses the queen's house said the priest pointing them out they passed through open courtyards paved with flat stones and the priest whispered to a guard at a great inner gate we are fortunate he said to the children pharaoh is even now in the court of honor now don't forget to be overcome with respect and admiration it won't do any harm if you fall flat on your faces and whatever you do don't speak until you're spoken to there used to be that rule in our country said robert when my father was a little boy at the outer end of the great hall a crowd of people were arguing with and even shoving the guards who seemed to make it a rule not to let any one through unless they were bribed to do it the children heard several promises of the utmost richness and wondered whether they would ever be kept all round the hall were pillars of painted wood the roof was of cedar gorgeously inlaid about halfway up the hall was a wide shallow step that went right across the hall then a little farther on another and then a steep flight of narrower steps leading right up to the throne on which pharaoh sat he sat there very splendid his red and white double crown on his head and his sceptre in his hand the throne had a canopy of wood and wooden pillars painted in bright colours on a low broad bench that ran all round the hall sat the friends relatives and courtiers of the king leaning on richly covered cushions the priest led the children up the steps till they all stood before the throne and then suddenly he fell on his face with hands outstretched the others did the same anthea falling very carefully because of the samiad raise them said the voice of pharaoh that they may speak to me the officers of the king's household raised them who are these strangers pharaoh asked and added very crossly and what do you mean rachmara by daring to come into my presence while your innocence is not established o oh, great king said the young priest you are the very image of ra and the likeness of his son horus in every respect you know the thoughts of the hearts of the gods and of men and you have divined that these strangers are the children of the children of the vile and conquered kings of the empire where the sun never sets they know a magic not known to the egyptians and they come with gifts in their hands as tribute to pharaoh in whose heart is the wisdom of the gods and on his lips their truth that is all very well said pharaoh but where are the gifts the children bowing as well as they could in their embarrassment at finding themselves the centre of interest in a circle more grand more golden and more highly coloured than they could have imagined possible pulled out the padlock the necessaire and the tie-clip but it's not tribute all the same cyril muttered england doesn't pay tribute pharaoh examined all the things with great interest when the chief of the household had taken them up to him deliver them to the keeper of the treasury he said to one near him and to the children he said a small tribute truly but strange and not without worth and the magic o rechmar 
these unworthy sons of a conquered nation began rech mara nothing of the kind cyril whispered angrily of a vile and conquered nation can make fire to spring from dry wood in the sight of all i should jolly well like to see them do it said pharaoh just as the priest had done so cyril without more ado did it do more magic said the king with simple appreciation he cannot do any more magic said antia suddenly and all eyes were turned on her because of the voice of the free people who were shouting for bread and onions and beer and a long midday rest if the people had what they wanted he could do more a rude spoken girl said pharaoh but give the dogs what they want he said without turning his head let them have their rest and their extra rations there are plenty of slaves to work a richly dressed official hurried out you will be the idol of the people brechmara whispered joyously the temple of amen will not contain their offerings cyril struck another match and all the court was overwhelmed with delight and wonder and when cyril took the candle from his pocket and lighted it with the match and then held the burning candle up before the king the enthusiasm knew no bounds o oh, greatest of all before whom sun and moon and stars bow down said rechmara insinuatingly am i pardoned is my innocence made plain as plain as it ever will be i dare say said pharaoh shortly get along with you you are pardoned go in peace the priest went with lightning swiftness and what said the king suddenly is it that moves in that sack show me o oh strangers there was nothing for it but to show the samiad seize it said pharaoh carelessly a very curious monkey it will be a nice little novelty for my wild beast collection and instantly the entreaties of the children availing as little as the bites of the samiad though both bites and entreaties were fervent it was carried away from before their eyes oh do be careful cried anthea at least keep it dry keep it in its sacred house she held up the embroidered bag it's a magic creature cried robert it's simply priceless you have no right to take it away cried jane incautiously it's a shame a barefaced robbery that's what it is there was an awful silence then pharaoh spoke take the sacred house of the beast from them he said and imprison all tonight after supper it may be our pleasure to see more magic guard them well and do not torture them yet oh dear sobbed jane as they were led away i knew exactly what it would be oh i wish you hadn't shut up silly said cyril you know you would come to egypt it was your own idea entirely shut up it'll be all right i thought we should play ball with the queens sobbed jane and have no end of larks and now everything's gonna be perfectly horrid <laughs> the room they were shut up in was a room and not a dungeon as the elder ones had feared that as anthea said was one comfort there were paintings on the wall that at any other time would have been most interesting and a sort of low couch and chairs when they were alone jane breathed a sigh of relief now we can get home all right she said and leave the samiad said anthea reproachfully wait a sec i've got an idea said cyril he pondered for a few moments then he began hammering on the heavy cedar door it opened and a guard put in his head stop that row he said sternly or look here cyril interrupted it's very dull for you isn't it just doing nothing but guard us wouldn't you like to see some magic we're not too proud to do it for you 
Wouldn't you like to see it? I don't mind if I do, said the guard. Well then, you get us that monkey of ours that was taken away and we'll show you. How do I know you're not making a game of me? asked the soldier. Shouldn't wonder if you only wanted to get the creature so as to set it on me. I dare say its teeth and claws are poisonous. Well, look here, said Robert. You see we've got nothing with us? You just shut the door and open it again in five minutes and we'll have got a magic, oh, I don't know, a magic flower in a pot for you. If you can do that, you can do anything, said the soldier, and he went out and barred the door. Then, of course, they held up the amulet. They found the east by holding it up and turning slowly till the amulet began to grow big, walked home through it, and came back with a geranium in full scarlet flower from the staircase window of the Fitzroy Street house. Well, said the soldier when he came in, I really am. We can do much more wonderful things than that, oh, ever so much, said Anthea persuasively. If only we have our monkey, and here's tuppence for yourself. The soldier looked at the tuppence. What's this? he said. Robert explained how much simpler it was to pay money for things than to exchange them, as the people were doing in the market. Later on, the soldier gave the coins to his captain, who, later still, showed them to Pharaoh, who of course kept them, and was much struck with the idea. That was really how coins first came to be used in Egypt. You will not believe this, I dare say, but really, if you believe the rest of the story, I don't see why you shouldn't believe this as well. I say, said Anthea, struck by a sudden thought, I suppose it'll be all right about those workmen. The king won't go back on what he said about them just because he's angry with us. Oh, no, said the soldier. You see, he's rather afraid of magic. He'll keep to his word right enough. Then that's all right, said Robert, and Anthea said softly and coaxingly, Oh, do get us the monkey, and then you'll see some lovely magic. Do, there's a nice kind soldier. I don't know where they've put your precious monkey, but if I can get another chap to take on my duty here, I'll see what I can do, he said grudgingly, and went out. Do you mean, said Robert, that we're going off without even trying for the other half of the amulet? I really think we'd better, said Anthea tremulously. Of course, the other half of the amulet's here somewhere, or our half wouldn't have brought us here. I do wish we could find it. It's a pity we don't know any real magic. Then we could find out. I do wonder where it is exactly. If they had only known it, something very like the other half of the amulet was very near them. It hung round the neck of someone, and that someone was watching them through a chink high up in the wall, specially devised for watching people who were imprisoned but they did not know. There was nearly an hour of anxious waiting. They tried to take an interest in the picture on the wall, a picture of harpers playing very odd harps and women dancing at a feast. They examined the painted plaster floor, and the chairs were of white painted wood with coloured stripes at intervals. But the time went slowly, and everyone had time to think of how Pharaoh had said, Don't torture them yet if the worst comes to the worst said cyril we must just bunk and leave the samiad i believe it can take care of itself well enough they won't kill it or hurt it when they find it can speak and give wishes they'll build it a temple i shouldn't wonder i couldn't bear to go without it said anthea and pharaoh said after supper that won't be just yet and the soldier was curious i'm sure we're all right for the present all the same, the sounds of the door being unbarred seemed one of the prettiest sounds possible. Suppose he hasn't got the Samiad, whispered Jane. But that doubt was set at rest by the Samiad itself, for almost before the door was open, it sprang through the chink of it into Anthea's arms, shivering and hunching up its fur. Here's its fancy overcoat, said the soldier, holding out the bag into which the Samiad immediately crept. Now, said Cyril, what would you like us to do? Anything you'd like us to get for you? Any little trick you like, said the soldier. If you can get a strange flower blooming in an earthenware vase, you can get anything, I suppose, 
he said. I just wish I got two men's loads of jewels from the king's treasury. That's what I've always wished for. At the word wish, the children knew that the Samiad would attend to that bit of magic. It did, and the floor was littered with a spreading heap of gold and precious stones. Any other little trick? asked Cyril loftily. Shall we become invisible? Vanish? Yes, if you like, said the soldier. But not through the door, you don't. He closed it carefully and set his broad Egyptian back against it. No, no, cried a voice high up among the tops of the tall wooden pillars that stood against the wall. There was a sound of someone moving above. The soldier was as much surprised as anybody. That's magic, if you like, he said, and then Jane held up the amulet, uttering the word of power. At the sound of it, and at the sight of the amulet growing into the great arch, the soldier fell flat on his face among the jewels with a cry of awe and terror. The children went through the arch with a quickness born of long practice, but Jane stayed in the middle of the arch and looked back. The others, standing on the dining-room carpet in Fitzroy Street, turned and saw her still in the arch. "'Someone's holding her!' cried Cyril. "'We must go back!' But they pulled at Jane's hands, just to see if she would come, and of course she did come. Then, as usual, the arch was little again, and there they all were. "'Oh, I do wish you hadn't,' Jane said crossly. "'It was so interesting. The priest had come in, and he was kicking the soldier, and telling him he'd done it now, and they must take the jewels and flee for their lives.' "'And did they?' "'I don't know. You interfered.' said Jane ungratefully. I should have liked to see the last of it. As a matter of fact, none of them had seen the last of it, if by it Jane meant the adventure of the priest and the soldier. End of chapter 11《The Story of the Amulet》by Edith Nesbitt Chapter 12 The Sorry Present and the Expelled Little Boy "'Look here,' said Cyril, sitting on the dining-table and swinging his legs. "'I really have got it.' "'Got what?' was the not unnatural rejoinder of the others. Cyril was making a boat with a penknife and a piece of wood, and the girls were making warm frocks for their dolls for the weather was growing chilly. Why, don't you see? It's really not any good our going into the past looking for that amulet. The past's as full of different times as... as the sea is of sand. We're simply bound to hit upon the wrong time. We might spend our lives looking for the amulet and never see a sight of it. Why, it's the end of September already. It's like looking for a needle in... A bottle of hay, I know interrupted Robert. But if we don't go on doing that, what are we to do? That's just it, said Cyril in mysterious accents. Oh, bother. Old Nurse had come in with the tray of knives, forks, and glasses, and was getting the tablecloth and table napkins out of the chiffonier drawer. It's always mealtimes just when you come to anything interesting. And a nice, interesting handful you'd be, Master Cyril said old nurse if i wasn't to bring your meals up to time don't you begin grumbling now fear you get something to grumble at i wasn't grumbling said cyril quite untruly but it does always happen like that you deserve to have something happen said old nurse slave 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 for you day and night and never a word of thanks why you do everything beautifully said anthea it's the first time any of you's troubled to say so, anyhow," said Nurse shortly. "'What's the use of saying?' inquired Robert. "'We eat our meals fast enough, and almost always two helps. That ought to show you.' "'Ah,' said old Nurse, going round the table and putting the knives and forks in their places. "'You're a man all over, Master Robert. There was my poor Green. All the years he lived with me, I never could get more out of him than—' "'It's all right.' when I asked him if he'd fancied his dinner. And yet, when he lay a-dying, 
His last words to me was, Maria, you was always a good cook. She ended with a trembling voice. And so you are, cried Anthea, and she and Jane instantly hugged her. When she had gone out of the room, Anthea said, I know exactly how she feels. Now, look here, let's do a penance to show we're sorry we didn't think about telling her before what nice cooking she does, and what a dear she is. Penances are silly, said Robert. Not if the penance is something to please someone else. I didn't mean old peas and hair shirts and sleeping on the stones. I mean, we'll make her a sorry present, explained Anthea. Look here. I vote Cyril doesn't tell us his idea until we've done something for old nurse. It's worse for us than him, she added hastily, because he knows what it is and we don't. Do you all agree? The others would have been ashamed not to agree, so they did. It was not till quite near the end of dinner, mutton fritters and blackberry and apple pie, that out of the earnest talk of the four came an idea that pleased everybody and would, they hoped, please nurse. Cyril and Robert went out, with the taste of apple still in their mouths, and the purple of blackberries on their lips, and, in the case of Robert, on the wristband as well, and bought a big sheet of cardboard at the stationer's, then at the plumber's shop, that has tubes and pipes and taps and gas fittings in the window, they bought a pane of glass, the same size as the cardboard. The man cut it with a very interesting tool that had a bit of diamond at the end and he gave them, out of his own free generousness, a large piece of putty and a small piece of glue. While they were out, the girls had floated four photographs of the four children off their cards in hot water. These were now stuck in a row along the top of the cardboard. Cyril put the glue to melt in a jam-pot, and put the jam-pot in a saucepan, and saucepan on the fire, while Robert painted a wreath of poppies round the photographs. He painted rather well, and very quickly and poppies are easy to do if you've once been shown how. Then Anthea drew some printed letters, and Jane coloured them. The words were, With all our loves to show, we like the things to eat. And when the painting was dry, they all signed their names at the bottom, and put the glass on, and glued brown paper round the edge and over the back, and put two loops of tape to hang it up by. Of course, everyone saw when too late, that there were not enough letters in things, so the missing N was put in. It was impossible, of course, to do the whole thing over again for just one letter. There, said Anthea, placing it carefully face up under the sofa. It'll be hours before the glue's dry. Now, Squirrel, fire ahead. Well, then, said Cyril, in a great hurry, rubbing at his gluey hands with his pocket handkerchief. What I mean to say is this. There was a long pause. Well, said Robert at last, what is it that you mean to say? It's like this, said Cyril, and again stopped short. Like what? asked Jane. How can I tell you if you will all keep on interrupting? said Cyril sharply. So no one said any more, and with wrinkled frowns he arranged his ideas. Look here he said. What I really mean is, we can remember now what we did when we went to look for the amulet, and if we'd found it, we should remember that too. Rather, said Robert, only you see we haven't. But in the future we shall have. Shall we, though? said Jane. Yes, unless we've been made fools of by the Samiad. So then, where we want to go is to where we shall remember about where we did find it. I see, said Robert, but he didn't. I don't, said Anthea, who did very nearly. Say it again, Squirrel, and very slowly. If, said Cyril, very slowly indeed, we go into the future after we've found the amulet. But we've got to find it first, said Jane. Hush, said Anthea. There will be a future, said Cyril, driven to greater clearness by the blank faces of the other three. There will be a time after we found it. Let's go into that time, and then we shall remember how we found it, and then we can go back and do the finding really. I see, said Robert, and this time he did, and I hope you do. 
Yes, said Anthea. Oh, Squirrel, how clever of you! But will the amulet work both ways? inquired Robert. It ought to, said Cyril. If time's only a thing of me of what's its name. Anyway, we might try. Let's put on our best things then, urged Jane. You know what people say about progress and the world growing better and brighter. I expect people will be awfully smart in the future. All right, said Anthea. We should have to wash anyway. I'm all thick with glue. When everyone was clean and dressed, the charm was held up. We want to go into the future and see the amulet after we found it, said Cyril, and Jane said the word of power. They walked through the big arch of the charm, straight into the British Museum. They knew it at once, and there, right in front of them, under a glass case, was the amulet, their own half of it, as well as the other half they had never been able to find, and the two were joined by a pin of red stone that formed a hinge. Oh, glorious! cried Robert. Here it is. Yes, said Cyril very gloomily. Here it is but we can't get it out. No, said Robert, remembering how impossible the Queen of Babylon had found it to get anything out of the glass cases in the museum, except by Samiad magic, and then she hadn't been able to take anything away with her. No, but we remember where we got it, and we can— Oh, do we? interrupted Cyril bitterly. Do you remember where we got it? No, said Robert. I don't exactly, now I come to think of it. Nor did any of the others. But why can't we? said Jane. Oh, I don't know. Cyril's tone was impatient. Some silly old enchanted rule, I suppose. I wish people would teach you magic at school like they do sums, or instead of. It would be some use having an amulet then. I wonder how far we are in the future, said Anthea. The museum looks just the same, only lighter and brighter somehow. Let's go back and try the past again, said Robert. Perhaps the museum people could tell us how we got it, said Anthea with sudden hope. There was no one in the room, but in the next gallery, where the Assyrian things are, and still were, they found a kind, stout man in a loose blue gown and stockinged legs. Oh, they've got a new uniform, how pretty, said Jane. When they asked him their question, he showed them a label on the case. It said, From the collection of... A name followed, and it was the name of the learned gentleman, who, among themselves, and to his face, when he had been with them at the other side of the amulet, they had called Jimmy. That's not much good, said Cyril. Thank you. How is it you are not at school? asked the kind man in blue. Not expelled for long, I hope. We're not expelled at all, said Cyril rather warmly. Well, I shouldn't do it again if I were you, said the man, and they could see he did not believe them. There is no company so little pleasing as that of people who do not believe you. Thank you for showing us the label, said Cyril, and they came away. As they came through the doors of the museum, they blinked at the sudden glory of sunlight and blue sky. The houses opposite the museum were gone. Instead, there was a big garden, with trees and flowers and smooth green lawns, and not a single notice to tell you not to walk on the grass, and not to destroy the trees and shrubs, and not to pick the flowers. There were comfortable seats all about, and arbours covered with roses, and long trellised walks, also rose-covered, whispering splashing fountains fell into full white marble basins white statues gleamed among the leaves and the pigeons that swept about among the branches or pecked on the smooth soft gravel were not black and tumbled like the museum pigeons are now but bright and clean and sleek as birds of new silver a good many people were sitting on the seats and on the grass babies were rolling and kicking and playing with very little on indeed. Men as well as women seemed to be in charge of the babies, and were playing with them. It's like a lovely picture, said Anthea, and it was, for the people's clothes were of bright soft colours, 
and all beautifully and very simply made no one seemed to have any hats or bonnets but there were a great many japanese-looking sunshades and among the trees were hung lamps of coloured glass i expect they light those in the evening said jane i do wish we lived in the future they walked down the path and as they went the people on the benches looked at the four children very curiously but not rudely or unkindly the children in their turn looked i hope they did not stare at the faces of these people in the beautiful soft clothes those faces were worth looking at not that they were all handsome though even in the matter of handsomeness they had the advantage of any set of people the children had ever seen but it was the expression of their faces that made them worth looking at the children could not tell at first what it was i know said anthea suddenly they're not worried that's what it is and it was everybody looked calm no one seemed to be in a hurry no one seemed to be anxious or fretted and though some did seem to be sad not a single one looked worried but though the people looked kind every one looked so interested in the children that they began to feel a little shy and turned out of the main path into a narrow little one that wound among trees and shrubs and mossy dripping springs it was here in a deep shadowed cleft between tall cypresses that they found the expelled little boy he was lying face downward on the mossy turf and the peculiar shaking of his shoulders was a thing they had seen more than once in each other so anthea kneeled down by him and said what's the matter i'm expelled from school said the boy between his sobs this was serious people are not expelled for light offences do you mind telling us what you'd done i i tore up a sheet of paper and threw it about in the playground said the child in the tone of one confessing an unutterable baseness you won't talk to me any more now you know that he added without looking up was that all asked anthea it's about enough said the child and i'm expelled for the whole day i don't quite understand said anthea gently the boy lifted his face rolled over and sat up why whoever on earth are you he said we're strangers from a far country said anthea in our country it's not a crime to leave a bit of paper about it is here said the child if grown-ups do it they're fined when we do it we're expelled for the whole day well but said robert that just means a day's holiday you must come from a long way off said the little boy a holiday is when you all have play and treats and jolliness all of you together on your expelled days no one'll speak to you everyone sees you're an expelleder or you'd be in school suppose you were ill nobody is hardly if they are of course they wear the badge and everyone is kind to you i know a boy that stole his sister's illness badge and wore it when he was expelled for a day he got expelled for a week for that it must be awful not to go to school for a week do you like school then asked robert incredulously of course i do it's the loveliest place there is i chose railways for my special subject this year there are such splendid models and things and now i shall be all behind because of that torn up paper you choose your own subject asked cyril yes of course where did you come from don't you know anything no said jane definitely so you'd better tell us well on midsummer day school breaks up and everything's decorated with flowers and you choose your special subject for next year of course you have to stick to it for a year at least then there are all your other subjects of course reading and painting and the rules of citizenship good gracious 
said Anthea. Look here, said the child, jumping up. It's nearly four. The expelledness only lasts till then. Come home with me. Mother will tell you all about everything. Will your mother like you taking home strange children? asked Anthea. I don't understand, said the child, settling his leather belt over his honey-coloured smock and stepping out with hard little bare feet. Come on. So they went. The streets were wide and hard and very clean. There were no horses, but a sort of motor carriage that made no noise. The Thames flowed between green banks, and there were trees at the edge, and people sat under them fishing, for the stream was clear as crystal. Everywhere there were green trees, and there was no smoke. The houses were set in what seemed like one green garden. The little boy brought them to a house, and at the window was a good, bright mother face. The little boy rushed in, and through the window they could see him hugging his mother, then his eager lips moving and his quick hands pointing. A lady in soft green clothes came out, spoke kindly to them, and took them into the oddest house they had ever seen. It was very bare, there were no ornaments, and yet every single thing was beautiful, from the dresser, with its rows of bright china, to the thick squares of eastern-looking carpet on the floors. I can't describe that house, I haven't the time, and I haven't heart, either, when I think how different it was from our houses. The lady took them all over it. The oddest thing of all was the big room in the middle. It had padded walls, and a soft thick carpet, and all the chairs and tables were padded. There wasn't a single thing in it that anyone could hurt itself with. Whatever is this for? Lunatics? asked Cyril. The lady looked very shocked. No! It's for the children, of course, she said. Don't tell me that in your country there are no children's rooms. There are nurseries, said Anthea doubtfully. But the furniture's all cornery and hard, like other rooms. How shocking, said the lady. You must be very much behind the times in your country. Why, the children are more than half of the people. It's not much to have one room where they can have a good time and not hurt themselves. But there's no fireplace, said Anthea. Hot air pipes, of course, said the lady. Why, how could you have a fire in a nursery? A child might get burned. In our country, said Robert suddenly, more than three thousand children are burned to death every year. Father told me, he added, as if apologizing for this piece of information. Once when I'd been playing with fire. The lady turned quite pale. What a frightful place you must live in, she said. What's all the furniture padded for? Anthea asked, hastily turning the subject. Why, you couldn't have little tots of two or three running about in rooms where the things were hard and sharp. They might hurt themselves. Robert fingered the scar on his forehead, where he had hit it against the nursery fender when he was little. But does everyone have rooms like this, poor people and all? asked Anthea. There's a room like this wherever there's a child, of course, said the lady. <laughs> How refreshingly ignorant you are! No, I don't mean ignorant, my dear. Of course, you're awfully well up in ancient history. But I see you haven't done your duties of citizenship course yet. But beggars and people like that, persisted Anthea. And tramps and people who haven't got any homes? People who haven't any homes, repeated the lady. I really don't understand what you're talking about. It's all different in our country, said Cyril carefully. And I have read it used to be different in London. You sent people to have no homes and beg because they were hungry? And wasn't London very black and dirty once upon a time? And the tins all muddy and filthy? And narrow streets and... You must have been reading very old-fashioned books, said the lady. Why, all that was in the Dark Ages. My husband can tell you more about it than I can. He took ancient history as one of his special subjects. I haven't seen any working people, said Anthea. Why, we're all working people, said the lady. 
at least my husband's a carpenter good gracious said anthea but you're a lady ah said the lady that quaint old word well my husband will enjoy a talk with you in the dark ages every one was allowed to have a smoky chimney and those nasty horses all over the streets and all sorts of rubbish thrown into the thames and of course the sufferings of the people will hardly bear thinking of it's very learned of you to know it all did you make ancient history your special subject not exactly said cyril rather uneasily what is the duties of citizenship course about don't you really know aren't you pretending just for fun really not well that course teaches you how to be a good citizen what you must do and what you mayn't do so as to do your full share of the work of making your town a beautiful and happy place for people to live in there's a quite simple little thing they teach the tiny children how does it go ah i must not steal and i must learn nothing is mine that i do not earn i must try in work and play to make things beautiful every day i must be kind to every one and never let cruel things be done i must be brave and i must try when i am hurt never to cry and always to laugh as much as i can and be glad that i'm going to be a man to work for my living and help the rest and never do less than my very best that's very easy said jane i could remember that that's only the very beginning of course said the lady there are heaps more rhymes there's the one beginning i must not litter the beautiful street with bits of paper or things to eat i must not pick the public flowers they are not mine but they are ours and things to eat reminds me are you hungry wells run and get a tray of nice things why do you call him wells asked robert as the boy ran off it's after the great reformer surely you've heard of him he lived in the dark ages and he saw that what you ought to do is to find out what you want and then try to get it up to then people had always tried to tinker up what they'd got we've got a great many of the things he thought of then wells means springs of clear water it's a nice name don't you think here wells returned with strawberries and cakes and lemonade on a tray and everybody ate and enjoyed now wells said the lady run off or you'll be late and not meet your daddy wells kissed her waved to the others and went look here said anthea suddenly would you like to come to our country and see what it's like it wouldn't take you a minute the lady laughed but jane held up the charm and said the word what a splendid conjuring trick cried the lady enchanted with the beautiful growing arch go through said anthea the lady went laughing but she did not laugh when she found herself suddenly in the dining-room at fitzroy street oh what a horrible trick she cried what a hateful dark ugly place she ran to the window and looked out the sky was grey the street was foggy a dismal organ grinder was standing opposite the door a beggar and a man who sold matches were quarrelling at the edge of the pavement on whose greasy black surface people hurried along hastening to get to the shelter of their houses oh look at their faces their horrible faces she cried what's the matter with them all they're poor people that's all said robert but it's not all they're ill they're unhappy they're wicked oh do stop it there's dear children it's very very clever some sort of magic lantern trick i suppose like i've read of but do stop it oh their poor tired miserable wicked faces the tears were in her eyes anthea signed to jane the arch grew 
they spoke the words and pushed the lady through it into her own time and place where london is clean and beautiful and the thames runs clear and bright and the green trees grow and no one is afraid or anxious or in a hurry there was a silence then i'm glad we went said anthea with a deep breath i'll never throw paper about again as long as i live said robert mother always told us not to said jane i would like to take up the duties of citizenship for a special subject said cyril i wonder if father could put me through it i shall ask him when he comes home if we'd found the amulet father could be home now said anthea and mother and the lamb let's go into the future again suggested jane brightly perhaps we could remember if it wasn't such an awful way off so they did this time they said the future where the amulet is not so far away and they went through the familiar arch into a large light room with three windows facing them was the familiar mummy case and at a table by the window sat the learned gentleman they knew him at once though his hair was white he was one of the faces that do not change with age in his hand was the amulet complete and perfect he rubbed his other hand across his forehead in the way they were so used to dreams dreams he said old age is full of them you've been in dreams with us before now said robert don't you remember i do indeed said he the room had many more books than the fitzroy street room and far more curious and wonderful assyrian and egyptian objects the most wonderful dreams i ever had had you in them where asked cyril did you get that thing in your hand if you weren't just a dream he answered smiling you'd remember that you gave it to me but where did we get it cyril asked eagerly ah you never would tell me that he said you always had your little mysteries you dear children what a difference you made to that old bloomsbury house i wish i could dream you oftener now you're grown up you're not like you used to be grown up said anthea the learned gentleman pointed to a frame with four photographs in it there you are he said the children saw four grown-up people's portraits two ladies two gentlemen and looked on them with loathing shall we grow up like that whispered jane how perfectly horrid if we're ever like that we shan't know it's horrid i expect anthea with some insight whispered back you see you get used to yourself while you're changing it's it's being so sudden makes it seem so frightful now the learned gentleman was looking at them with wistful kindness don't let me undream you just yet he said there was a pause do you remember when we gave you that amulet cyril asked suddenly you know or you would if you weren't a dream that it was on the third december nineteen o five i shall never forget that day thank you said cyril earnestly oh thank you very much you've got a new room said anthea looking out of the window and what a lovely garden yes said he i'm too old now to care even about being near the museum this is a beautiful place do you know i can hardly believe you're just a dream you do look so exactly real do you know his voice dropped i can say it to you though of course if i said it to anyone that wasn't a dream they'd call me mad there was something about that amulet you gave me something very mysterious there was that said robert ah i don't mean your pretty little childish mysteries about where you got it but about the thing itself first the wonderful dreams i used to have after you'd shown me the first half of it why my book on atlantis 
that I did was the beginning of my fame and my fortune, too. And I got it all out of a dream. And then, Britain at the time of the Roman invasion, that was only a pamphlet, but it explained a lot of things people hadn't understood. Yes, it would, said Anthea. That was the beginning. But after you'd given me the whole of the amulet, ah, it was generous of you. Then, somehow, I didn't need to theorize. I seemed to know about the old Egyptian civilization. And they can't upset my theories. He rubbed his thin hands and laughed triumphantly. They can't, though they've tried. Theories, they call them. But they're more like, I don't know, more like memories. I know I'm right about the secret rites of the Temple of Amen. I'm so glad you're rich, said Anthea. You weren't, you know, at Fitzroy Street. Indeed, I wasn't, said he. But I am now. This beautiful house and this lovely garden. I dig in it sometimes. You remember, you used to tell me to take more exercise. Well, I feel I owe it all to you and the amulet. I'm so glad said Anthea, and kissed him. He started. That didn't feel like a dream, he said, and his voice trembled. It isn't exactly a dream, said Anthea softly. It's all part of the amulet. It's a sort of extra special real dream, dear Jimmy. Ah, said he, when you call me that, I know I'm dreaming. My little sister, I dream of her sometimes. But it's not real like this. Do you remember the day I dreamed you brought me the Babylonish ring? We remember it all, said Robert. Did you leave Fitzroy Street because you were too rich for it? Oh, no, he said reproachfully. You know I should never have done such a thing as that. Of course, I left when your old nurse died, and uh, what's the matter? Old nurse? Dead? said Anthea. Oh, no! Yes, yes, it's the common lot. It's a long time ago now. Jane held up the amulet in a hand that twittered. Come! She cried. Oh, come home! She may be dead before we get there, and then we can't give it to her. Oh, come! Oh, don't let dream end now, pleaded the learned gentleman. It must, said Anthea firmly, and kissed him again. When it comes to people dying, said Robert, Goodbye. I'm so glad you're rich and famous and happy. Do come, cried Jane, stamping in her agony of impatience, and they went. Old Nurse brought in tea almost as soon as they were back in Fitzroy Street. As she came in with the tray, the girls rushed at her and nearly upset her and it. Don't die, cried Jane. Oh, don't, and Anthea cried. Dear ducky, darling old nurse, don't die. Lord love you, said nurse. I'm not a-going to die yet a while, please heaven. Whatever on earth's the matter with the chicks? Nothing, only don't. She put the tray down and hugged the girls in turn. The boys thumped her on the back with heartfelt affection. I'm as well as ever I was in my life, she said. What nonsense about dying. You've been a-sittin' too long in the dusk, that's what it is. Regular blind man's holiday. Leave go of me while I light the gas. The yellow light illuminated four pale faces. We do love you so, Anthea went on. And we've made you a picture to show you how we love you. Get it out, Squirrel. The glazed testimonial was dragged out from under the sofa and displayed. The glue's not dry yet, said Cyril. Look out! What a beauty! cried old nurse. Well, I never. And your pictures and the beautiful writing and all? Well, I always did say your hearts was in the right place, if a bit careless at times. Well, I never did. I don't know as I was ever pleased better in my life. She hugged them all, one after the other, and the boys did not mind it somehow that day. How is it we can remember all about the future now? 
and he awoke the samiad with laborious gentleness to put the question how is it we can remember what we saw in the future and yet when we were in the future we could not remember the bit of the future that was past then the time of finding the amulet why what a silly question said the samiad of course you cannot remember what hasn't happened yet but the future hasn't happened yet anthea persisted and we remember that all right ah oh, well that isn't what's happened my good child said the samiad rather crossly that's prophetic vision and you remember dreams don't you so why not visions you never do seem to understand the simplest thing it went to sand again at once anthea crept down in her nightgown to give one last kiss to old nurse and one last look at the beautiful testimonial hanging by its tapes its glue now firmly set in glazed glory on the wall of the kitchen good night bless your love and heart said old nurse if only you don't catch your death or cold. End of chapter 12